first of all, I want to just thank you all for being here. I think I really appreciate the, the large turnout. Uh, I think we're extraordinarily fortunate this evening to have with us Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, Distinguished Visiting Professor of Government and Public Policy at the College of William & Mary, and Chief of Staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell from August 2002 to January 2005. Colonel Wilkerson is indeed distinguished. In March 1989, he joined General Powell at the U.S. Army's Forces Command in Atlanta, Georgia as his Deputy Executive Officer. He followed General Powell to his next position as Chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, serving as his Special Assistant. Upon Powell's retirement from active service in 1993, Colonel Wilkerson served as the Deputy Director and then Director of the U.S. Marine Corps War College at Quantico, Virginia. Upon Wilkerson's retirement from active service in 1997, he began working for General Powell in a private capacity as a consultant and as an advisor. In December 2000, Secretary of State Designate Colin Powell asked Wilkerson to join him in the transition office at the U.S. State Department, and later upon his confirmation as Secretary of State, Secretary Powell moved Wilkerson to his policy planning staff with responsibilities for East Asia and the Pacific and legislative and political military affairs. In June 2002, the Director for Policy Planning, Ambassador Richard Haas, made Colonel Wilkerson the Associate Director. In August 2002, Secretary Powell moved Colonel Wilkerson to the position of Chief of Staff of the Department. Colonel Wilkerson is a veteran of the Vietnam War, as well as a U.S. Army Pacific Hand, having served in Korea, Japan, and Hawaii. Prior to his work for General Colin Powell, Wilkerson was Executive Assistant to U.S. Navy Admiral Stuart A. Ring, Director for Strategy and Policy, U.S. Pacific Command. Wilkerson has also served on the faculty of the U.S. Naval War College and holds two advanced degrees, one in international relations and the other in national security studies. He has written extensively on military and national security affairs, especially, especially for college-level curricula, and has published in a number of professional journals, including the Naval Institute's Proceedings, the Naval War College Review, Military Review, and Joint Force Quarterly. Colonel Wilkerson, on, on behalf of the University of Dallas and on behalf of the Departments of History and Politics, I thank you very much and profoundly for agreeing to speak here this evening on the reasons why we need not be enemies. The United States and Iran in the 21st century. Let us give Colonel Wilkerson a very warm welcome. Thank you so much. I'm used to doing seminars with my students, and I don't like microphones. Plus, I like to walk around. Um, I just did a TV show out there, so thank you for waiting for a few minutes before I, before I came in. I, I just want to relate one aspect of it to you. We military people normally don't speak out. It's become a custom for generals and admirals every now and then to endorse presidential candidates <coughs> from time to time. And that would have turned George Washington's stomach and a lot of other people who served in the military because I don't think that's the way things should be done. I was only a colonel, so it's not quite as bad when I speak out. But I like to explain to people why, after 31 years of wearing a uniform and of killing people for state purposes, I decided that I had to say something. The issue was torture. My armed forces involved in torturing other people. Abu Ghraib and the results that came out of Abu Ghraib was really the spark that lit me off and lit the secretary off. He walked through my door that day and he said, I want to know what happened and I want you to find out. And I did. And it has gone nowhere from there until last week. Yep. Last week, the Constitution <coughs> Project's task force for detainee treatment released its report two years in the making, and though they did not have subpoena power, they did not have access to classified information because your pusillanimous, cowardly Congress wouldn't allow them to, mm -hmm. yeah. they still came up with the right answers. Yes, they did. And this was a panic. <laughs> this was a panel composed of your sister states, 
former congressman Asa Hutchinson and a member of my political party, the old Republican Party, <laughs> on the one hand, and on the other hand, Ambassador Tom Pickering, career ambassador, seven different major countries he was ambassador to. Wow. So it was an eclectic board that said, we want to answer some questions. First, did the United States torture? Answer resoundingly, yes. Dick Cheney, you're a liar. George Bush, Amen. you're a liar. Yeah. All right. Amen. Second, was that torture authorized unlike any other time in our history? Because let's face it, we've tortured before down at the lowest levels. We did it in Vietnam, we did it in the Philippines, we did it, but we were reprimanded and court martialed. Was that torture authorized for the first time in American history at the highest levels? Vice President and President, answer resoundingly, yes. Now then the task force goes on and uses its great talent at expiation and mitigation and so forth. But the bottom line of that report is that six lawyers who in the language of the report did acrobatic legal reasoning, acrobatic, they jumped over hoops and fell over themselves. Torture has to be organ failure. Oh, said the OLC memo. Wow. Those six lawyers, David Addington in the Vice President's office, Douglas Fife, Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, Alberto Gonzalez, mm -hmm. Counselor to the President, later Attorney General of this great country, William Haynes, OSD General Counsel, and others involved in the writing of the, limo, of the memo from OLC that said that about torture, Jay Bobby and John Yu, that they created a legal opinion. It wasn't just acrobatic, it was wrong. And in the face of what that report said, if we weren't the most powerful country in the world, if, as Mao Zedong said, power didn't come out of the barrel of a gun, we would be hauled before the ICC, and those people, those six lawyers, would be disbarred at a minimum, maybe jailed. And the leaders, the leaders would have to say something before a tribunal, and they'd have to tell the truth, or probably go to jail themselves. What am I talking about? I'm talking about war crimes. But if you are the biggest country in the world, no one is going to have the courage to call you there. That said, there's a case in Spain right now making its way to the Spanish Supreme Court oh, yeah. against the six lawyers. And I'm told the case in Germany is going to be re resurrected, too. I don't know exactly who they're going to name, but I saw the case five years ago and it named everybody. Named the president, the vice president, the attorney general, and so forth. So. That's why I decided it was no longer right for me to stay quiet. My wife turned to me one night and she said, listen, I've been married to you for 45 years. Your loyalty to your country is greater than your loyalty to a single individual. Because it gave me great pain to create circumstances that would estrange Colin Powell and me. And I looked back at her and I said, you know, you're always right. You're always right. That's why I spoke out and that's why I'm continuing to speak out. And the subject tonight is a subject near and dear to my heart and that I've been going all across the country to talk about because, ladies and gentlemen, we are looking at yet another three to four trillion dollar ten year minimum war in Western Asia. This one will be catastrophic. If you like the rack, stand by for this one. And there is utterly, absolutely no reason for it to happen other than the stupidity of Washington. And when I say Washington, I mean the Congress, I mean the President and his gang, and I mean the Supreme Court. I mean everybody in our government today. Everybody that has anything to say about it. Why would I throw the court in there? This administration is using the draconian measures invented by George W. Bush's administration more forcefully and aggressively than he did. Mm -hmm. We have prosecuted more whistleblowers in George W. Bush's administration than all the rest of them combined. Mm -hmm. It's incredible, the pursuit 
of people who were speaking truth to power. Absolutely incredible. But back to Iran for a moment. I sit on another group besides <laughs> the Constitution Project. This group is called the Iran Project. And for three years, we have been doing everything we can with every military officer we can get our hands on, <coughs> Admiral Fox Fallon, General Tony Zinni, General Joe Hoare, a host of military people who are of our mind, and diplomats like Tom Pickering and Jim Dobbins and Zig Brzezinski and Brent Scowcroft, Brent Scowcroft, a good Republican, national security advisor to Jerry Ford and George H.W. Bush. We've been doing everything we could to put this off, ward it off, stop it. And we've published three reports. I recommend all three of them to you. The first two were dispassionate analyses, no dog in the fight, politically speaking. Again, eclectic group of people working on it to simply examine, first, <coughs> cost and benefits of using the military instrument against Iran. Second, cost and benefits of international sanctions against Iran. Those came out about six months and four months ago, respectively. The third one we put out last week. The third one abandons our previous analytical approach and says, Okay, let's get policy specific. Let's make some recommendations. And it's called, I've got to remember the title. It's called something like uh, Balancing Pressure with Diplomacy. And what we mean by that, as we make our recommendations to the White House, and we're briefing uh, the Parliament next week and other members of the P5, the permanent five plus one, the negotiating, app negotiating apparatus with the Iranians uh, over the next month, what we mean by that is sanctions have gone as far as they should go and probably too far. Sanctions are now counterproductive. Not only are they injuring young men and women and children in Iran, and I've seen vivid movies of that, they are making the only people left in Western Asia, having watched Afghanistan and Iraq for the past 10, 12 years, hate us. The Persians in Iran actually like us. The people actually like our values. They like us, much the way Cubans do, interestingly. They don't hate us. They hate Washington, and they hate our policy. But we are making that group of Persians one of the oldest civilizations in the world. They're not part of the British detritus. The British didn't draw a line to make Persia like they did Iraq, like they did Afghanistan and Pakistan. They're a country, an empire for 5,000 years, if you wish. And they like us. And we're making them hate us by these sanctions. Not only that, the sanctions are now so coercive that the sanctions represent to the Iranian leadership, however despicable we may think they are, and many of them are, they're making the Iranian leadership think our objective is clear, regime change. Just as our objective was clear to Saddam Hussein. And guess who passed that objective as statutory U.S. policy? William Jefferson Clinton in 1998. And George W. Bush picked it up and Dick Cheney ran with it. Mm -hmm. So this is not what we should be doing any further. And yet today, as I left Washington, a North Dakota representative and an Iowa representative, as I recall, were trying to get further sanctions on Iranian airlines. These would close the door for Iranian travel to anywhere else in the world and close the door on Iranian-American travel to Iran or anybody's travel to Iran. Where did we get this idea that talking to our friends is fine, but talking to our enemies is treason? Where did we get this? You need an embassy in Pyongyang or Tehran far more than you need an embassy in London or Paris. Oh, yeah. That's the only intelligence you're going to get. Korea's a black hole to us. Why? We haven't had an embassy there since the war. Tehran's a black hole to us in many respects because the Swiss are our protecting power there, and the Swiss are not engaged in helping America do anything much. So we need an embassy there. And last do we need a close down on all conversation whatsoever, or all visits whatsoever. But this is what they're trying to do. They're also trying to tighten the bank sanctions. The bank sanctions are so bad right now 
that if you've got a child dying of diabetes, you can't go to the humanitarian part of the sanctions and say, I'd like to activate that and get this medicine for my child, because the banks won't allow you to do it. So it's a backdoor way of shutting everything down. And our Congress knows that. They know that. Lindsey Graham knows that. John McCain knows that because their objective is regime change. They want to make the Iranian people, they think, so angry that they'll overthrow their regime. Well, the Iranian people aren't going to do that. They're going to get angry at us, not their regime. The history of sanctions says that. If you've done any work at all in history, if you're not a member of the United States of Amnesia, as Lord Adal said. So this is crazy. The deal is there. The deal was there in Kazakhstan. The deal was there when Turkey and Brazil presented it to us, and we didn't want to do it because we just solidified sanctions and we're proud of ourselves for solidifying sanctions. It was quite an achievement to get the world to be as solid as it has on a set of international sanctions. The deal is there, though. The Iranians have said what they will do, and we have said, ah, uh, yes, what we will do. For all that that you're going to give up, by the way, we don't even know that you have it. But for all of that you're going to give up, we might give you a few airplane parts, and maybe we'll lift the sanctions for a month or so and let a few things flow. No, the Iranians want something substantial, because diplomacy is a win-win situation. You have to come away from the table, not with everything, but you have to come away with something. And so the sanctions right now, you know what they look like to me? I've been there. I've been there. I've seen this before. Wow. They look like the same thing that was happening in 2001 and 2002. And the same people orchestrating them. The same neoconservatives. In fact, they haven't even had the good sense to change the sheet of music because they think you're stupid. And you know something? For the last 20 years, the American people have pretty much corroborated that opinion. Dwight Eisenhower said in 1961 in his farewell address about the military-industrial complex, he said, only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can balance this awesome power. He wasn't calling them crooks or criminals. He was just saying what the founders said. When power accumulates, it will be abused. And when it accumulates with money, it will be abused mightily. And what we've allowed to happen is that alert and not knowledgeable citizenry no longer exist. Someone said to me right after watching the tragedy in Boston, you know, it's starting again and everything is just going downhill. I don't know if I can take it. And I looked at him and I said the same thing the, the, the wonderful gentleman who drove me here tonight said, I said, you know that more people die on the highways every year in our country than have been killed in every stinking terrorist attack in history? Do you know that? Do you know that we murdered 31,000 people in this country last year? What is this fear about? I'm prepared to go into any embassy the United States maintains in the world, rip all the fortifications down, and stand in the door of that embassy and say, this is America. We welcome you, the poor, the oppressed, those yearning to be free. Come into my embassy. <laughs> if somebody shoots you, I'm dead. Somebody replace me. Five Americans replace me. Ten replace me. That's the way I was taught as a soldier. I worked with the Marines. That's the way they were taught. You don't cower down behind 7,000 tons of concrete and say, you can only come in my embassy if you go through all those guards out there. That, you know what we look like to the world right now? We look like the biggest cowards on the face of the earth. And believe me, the more times we kill people with drones, the more times we act as if it doesn't matter, the more the rest of the world hates our guts and moves to balance us because that's history. When power becomes hegemonic, when power becomes blue, brutal and bloody and dangerous, then you're going to find Brazil and India and China and France and the United Kingdom and Germany and others banding together. 
and they're going to oppose us until <coughs> we look like a third world country. They may not even have to do that because we're doing it pretty readily to ourselves. Yeah, that's, right. yeah. that's for sure. And this is the sad situation that we find ourselves in. And at this time, when you go into Washington and you talk to people, it's like talking to a brick wall. Mm. I spent 30 days on the Hill. Mm. Friends Committee for National Legislation, the Quakers. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Quaker Colonel. <laughs> Hey, dude, why do you why do you want me to go over there? They said because you have bona fides. Please go with us. So I went, and we were just on the hill to talk about an incidents at sea agreement. That's all we were talking about. What does that mean? It means that we would have something with the Iranian Navy, not unlike what we had with the Soviet Navy for a long part of the Cold War, an agreement whereby if something were to occur in very crowded waters between our two navies, we'd immediately know how to deal with it. We'd have communications, we'd have a methodology, we'd have standard operating procedure, we'd be able to deal with it. So it wouldn't spiral into a hot war or a conflict. Well, I went over there and I talked to Democrats and Republicans alike. And it got quickly out of the EC agreement into everything. Banking sanctions, agricultural sanctions, you name it. We talked about the whole thing. And I saw immediately how many people over there all of them. Didn't matter whether I was talking to Diane Feinstein or John McCain. Mm. How many people were so limited in what they could say or do by the political space being narrowed by one country, Israel? They simply wouldn't speak up because it would look as if they were in some way threatening Israel, even anti-Israel. Mm. And I kept talking to them. I, for example, my own senator from Virginia, I said, you know better. You know, let me tell you something about Israel right now. Let me tell you something about Israel. Look at Israel. Israel is in a more dangerous position than it's been since 1948. Yeah. Nobody knows what's happening in Egypt. That's its most secure flank, most insecure now. Two rockets were just fired out of the Sinai and Eli. No one knows where Egypt's going. Syria is involved in a bloody, brutal civil war. Lebanon is falling apart. The government walked out. The government walked in. Hezbollah gains more and more control every day. Iraq, that wonderful achievement of my administration, <laughs> Iraq is Iran's best partner. Nouri al-Maliki, our leader in Baghdad, is an Iranian for all practical purposes. Holy. So not only did we, did we take out Iran's number one enemy, Iraq, and its number two enemy, the Taliban, we gave Iraq to Iran. Saudi Arabia is backing the Sunnis in Iraq with much, much money so the Sunnis can retake Baghdad from the Shia. Civil war is getting worse every day. Where do you read about it in the New York Times, the Washington Post, or any other newspaper? No, nobody wants to tell you about it. Iraq is falling apart. The whole region is a mess. This is what President Obama told Bibi Netanyahu when he was in Israel. What did any paper, though? I wouldn't have put it there either had I been the president. Bibi, are you an idiot? Look at your situation. You're in trouble. Pick up the phone and call Turkey. So what did Bibi do? He picked up the phone and called Ankara, and now he's trying to effect a rapprochement with Turkey because they're the only friend in the region that he has. Everybody else hates his gut. So. What are you talking about doing something for Israel here? You have made Israel, Mr. Congressman, Mr. Senator, very, very <laughs> dangerous place. Don't you understand anything about geostrategic reality? Oh, well, maybe. But they can't get off of it. They can't come off of it because they're so scared that somebody might withdraw their money or get them unelected. So I came away from there talking about an H.C. agreement knowing that there was no political space to maneuver. And what has the president done? He's painted himself into the corner that John McCain and Lindsey Graham want him in. He said no option is off the table. Mm -hmm. So what do you do when you come down the road another year, another two years maybe, you're still in your administration, can't get out of this, president, and diplomacy's failed? You either step down, you know, you back down, you say I wasn't serious, or you drop the bombs. So what happens if you drop the bombs? Read our first report. Mm -hmm. Israel drops the bombs, 
little bit of rubble, a few deaths. Iran probably won't even respond because Israel does not have the capability. We can sell them tankers all day, all day long. They just don't have the capability. You need around the clock multi-carrier operations. You need B-2s, F-117s, B-1s. You need cruise missiles. You need everything the United States has got for three solid weeks to do any damage. And then what do you get? This is what our report says. Remember, those four stars who signed up for our report, this is what you get. Five to seven years of delay in the nuclear program and a sound and immediate decision to weaponize. Oh, yeah. So what do you do? What do you do? I'll tell you what you have to do. You have to invade. You have to put 500,000 men and women on the ground for 10 years at least, a wow. couple of trillion, maybe three at the outside, and probably at the end of that decade, you've got an Iraq or an Afghanistan. So what do you do? Stay around? And you better think about staying around for Syria, Iran, mm -hmm. Iraq, Afghanistan, and the rest of the place that starts burning because of what you've done. And maybe, just maybe, you might start a, a global conflict with China and Russia entering too. Wow. This is what we all talked about when we did that first report. That's the reality of it. The American people need to wake up. Yes. Thank you. One of, my, one of my students, they teach me something every seminar. They don't believe this, but they do. One of my students said, <coughs> You know, we've just finished our case study presentations. They did the overthrow of Mossadegh in 53. They did uh, Guatemala in 54. They did uh, Bay of Pigs, the Cuban Missile Crisis, on up into the first Iraq War and beyond. And one of my students said, you know, it would seem to me that the reason for existence for the United States of America is to make war. Wow. Reminded me of what Marine General Smedley Butler once said after 29 oh, yeah. excursions. Yeah. Or the I never did a damn thing that wasn't for profit. Yeah. Um, Guatemala, boy, there's a good one. United Fruit Company, yeah. Chile, uh, Kennecott Mining. I mean, I, strategic rationales flourish. You know, we did Iraq for oil. Let's face it. The Iraq oil report just rendered its latest report saying 200 billion absolutely, 300 billion probably, and 400 billion barrels out on the outside. That's more than Saudi Arabia. Maliki himself, if he didn't have problems, has projected to be at 13.7 million barrels per day production capacity by 2016. He won't make it for political problems, but that shows you how much oil is in Iraq. That beats Saudi Arabia. Wow. That's why we went to Iraq. Oh, yeah. Why didn't we tell the American people that? And let them decide, let them judge, let them vote, let them evaluate. It had nothing to do with WMD, and nothing to do with Saddam Hussein, and nothing to do with spreading, spreading freedom and democracy. It had everything to do with a three letter word oil. And people say, like, well, look, nobody's got any contracts, ExxonMobil, Chevron. We don't like ExxonMobil. We don't like Chevron. We don't like Royal Dutch Shell. They're privates, they have no way of being leveraged. Mm -hmm. We'd rather see Mexico or China or Saudi Arabia, or some national entity get the oil because they're a lot easier to deal with. We can politically, diplomatically, and financially leverage them. Exxon Mobil doesn't give a crap about Washington. Rex Tillerson was recently in Kazakhstan, CEO of Exxon Mobil. He said he'd rather live in Kazakhstan than the United States. <laughs> That's because he lives here in Dallas. <laughs> the vice president of GE said to me and Leon first, sit to the table at the National Defense University. When Leon asked him, Leon was Al Gore's national security advisor, Leon asked him, said, why are you guys rotating that stealth factory in China? And he said, this will give the Chinese stealth technology. Oh, wow. No question about it. You locate anything in China, they're going to get it in two years. He looked at us and he said, fiduciary responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> Leon said, you're a traitor. Wow. I said, you're a traitor. Wow. He took great umbrage at that. <laughs> That's exactly what... I thought. Yep. He's a traitor. He's vice president for government liaison for GE, and he's saying they're relocating for due sharing responsibility. Mm -hmm. Got to pay those stockholders. You know, Got to pay the people who invest in GE. Hogwash. This is serious business. I'm talking here about the end of empire. 
I'm talking about this democratic federal republic, first, not being a democratic federal republic anymore, and second, because it isn't, losing a lot of power. How on earth do you have polls that show that 75, 80, 90 percent even of the American people are in favor of 100 percent background checks and then have the Senate vote it down? <laughs> How? Keeps terrorists, mentally unstable people, and criminals from having guns. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know if it'll work, but I'm certainly willing to try it. I own 13 guns, and I hunt like a, like a bear. You know? I hunt quail. I hunt pheasant. I've been a hunter all my life. I bought my six-year-old grandson a BB gun. My neighbors hate me for it. <laughs> <laughs> but I see it as the best way to teach my grandson about weapons. Because I go everywhere with him when he has that BB gun. I keep it otherwise. And when he's 13 or 14, I'll let him have it on his own. And the first time he does anything bad with it, I'll take it away from him and he'll never see it again. That's the way I look at guns. I'm not a gun hater. I don't belong to the NRA because I know the NRA is a show for the armaments industry. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, in your name, in your name, ladies and gentlemen, America led the world last year by a margin never before seen in human history. And most of that, 60 billion of that money, was to the Gulf Cooperation Council. You know, we scared them to death with regard to Iran. It's incredible. Go around the world and look at the war on drugs. Look at the war on drugs. In 1988, I turned to General Powell. I didn't dare speak too loudly because I just met him. But I said, you, you don't want a war on drugs, General. He said, why? I said, because it's unwinnable. What military man in his right head would be on a war that's unwinnable? Mm -hmm. And besides, the military's got no business in its war on drugs. Mm -hmm. It's a false war anyway. It's really a war on drugs so lots of rich people can stay rich. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Absolutely absurd. If IRS guy told me if you legalized marijuana, cocaine, and heroin tomorrow morning, you'd make $400 billion a year more in tax money. Wow. And he said, that's just the people we, we will get to tax. If we could tax them all, we'd probably make another five, six hundred billion. I'm not saying that you shouldn't take a good look at it before you do it, like Portugal has done, like others have done. But what I am saying is, how did we get along for 150 years with no drug war? And I would say we got along better than we're getting along now. Yeah. It's crazy. And to involve the military in it is contaminated to the maximum. I mean, you're just asking for trouble. And of course, as I said, you're asking for an unwinnable conflict. We got enough of those, General. <clears throat> but he saw it as something he owed President Reagan and uh, ultimately President H.W. Bush, who had started the war on drugs with Nixon kind of giving a, you know, a boost. Mm -hmm. And so we're still at it. And guess what? We haven't done squat. Mm -hmm. You know, we really have done nothing to the price of cocaine or whatever mm -hmm. on the streets. So, it's a lost cause, and yet we don't seem to know what to do about it. I was a briefing Atlantic Command, one of my Marines, Roger might, I don't think Roger was around at the time, but one of my Marines jumps up in the middle of the Admiral's <coughs> briefing. The Admiral was briefing on the drug war at that time. And the Admiral had briefed, well, you know, we're interdicting here in the Caribbean and in the Atlantic, and if they switch over to the Pacific, we'll interdict them there and everything, and so forth. And and he described this as centers of gravity of the drug war. And my Marine said, Admiral, I think you got that wrong. First of all, if you interdict in the Atlantic and Caribbean and interdict simultaneously in the Pacific, you know where it's going to go? It's going to go across the land mass of Mexico, and it's going to contaminate Mexico big time <clears throat> and destabilize the government. Bingo! <laughs> That's what's happened. And then he said, and your use of the Clausewitzian term center of gravity is off. The center of gravity of the drug war is not on those lines of communication coming out of Colombia and Mexico and so forth. It's in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. It's the people taking the drugs. Yeah. So you need rehabilitation programs and so forth, and you need to legalize. That's right. Yeah. He was taken aback. <laughs> but he, he, my, my Marine was right. I told you, Marines got guts. They'll stand up and they'll tell the truth. 
So where do we go from here with regard to my central topic here on? We need, and this, this came out of our study also, we need people who give a damn to start calling their congressmen and women and their senators and making known their views. That they, first of all, don't want another war. That they, second, do want diplomacy to work. And third, that diplomacy has to be real. It has to be a genuine effort. And let me just describe for a moment and then I'll close. What did we say would be a genuine effort? Well, we've really gone down the road now a long way to where it's got to be a lot more robust than it was before. Before, you know, by the way, we've been saying Iran would have a nuclear weapon for 20 years. Uh -huh. yeah. you know? Now it's gotten to the point where <clears throat> they're so entrenched, the Ayatollah hates Ahmadinejad's guts, can't wait for Ahmadinejad to leave, doesn't want Ahmadinejad to get any credit at all for a negotiated settlement, so we aren't going to even begin to get one until after the June elections in Iran. But it's gotten so tough in Tehran because of the sanctions and everything, and because of the way they're hurting the Persians in particular, but all the blukes, the Zeris, the Kurds, everybody in Iran, that it's going to have to be a different deal now. So what might that deal look like? Something like this problem. We would say to the Iranians, you cannot enrich any uranium above 5%. You can enrich, because that's, that's their prerogative under the non-proliferation treaty. Nothing wrong with that. <coughs> Others do it. You can enrich up to 5%. And if you need for medical isotopes and other things, which they do, you can buy that between 5 and 20, 20 being for medical isotopes and refueling or fueling of their reactor at Mushir. You can buy that on the world market, and we'll guarantee you will go to a good price, and you'll have a buyer or a seller. But you've got to do some other things, too. You've got to guarantee us you're not going to run off and try a plutonium track like the North Koreans did, because that's much easier to hide. You can hide a reprocessing plant really easily. It's pretty hard to hide enrichment. Um, and you've got to let us see all those facilities that the IAEA in the past has said you might have been doing dirty in. And you've got to prove to us that if you weren't doing dirty, you weren't. And if you were, fess up and show us how and why and that sort of thing. And in addition, you must allow us to establish a very intrusive, with protocols, inspection regime for the IAEA and its cameras and its people, cameras won't be enough, for at least five years until you've convinced the international community that you have no intention of developing a nuclear weapon. And for that, <coughs> we will give you massive sanctions relief. But, because sanctions are so difficult to reimpose, getting everybody together again would probably be impossible. We're only going to do it in a suspension way. That is to say, for the time you're, guar or the time you're guaranteeing us in which you're going to prove all this, we're going to suspend sanctions. The moment you look like you haven't proven something substantial or that you're lying, sanctions are going to go back on you. It's going to have to be something like that. And the P5 are going to have to agree, and Germany. Um, and I believe if you do something like that in, in good spirit, as it were, and you stop the clandestine operations, killing their scientists and so forth inside mm -hmm. Iran, that seems to me to be something you'd want to do while you're negotiating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you tell Israel, you do it and we'll smack you or withhold your $3 billion a year that we've been giving them for 30 years. You know, one of the most successful economies in the region, we still give them $3 billion gratis a year. Nonsense. American people, alert and knowledgeable. Huh? I was just up in New York at Temple Emanuel, invited there by the rabbi, one of the most affluent and successful synagogues in New York. I spoke to about 300 people. Not a single one of them descended from my point of view. 70% of America's Jews do not like what AIPAC, what Netanyahu, 
what Israel's government in general is doing and are fearful, as I said, for the future of Israel and for the future of their country, the United States. So why are we so scared? Because the others are so full of money and because they're so full of influence and because they have so compacted everybody's fear. You know? Someone said to me today, it's nonsense, it's nonsense what she just said. The uh, congressman from North Dakota, I I, I think, however you say it. Um, she said, you know, I understand the polls. I understand that 90% of the people from this precinct are poor background checks, but you know, the other 7% call me. And my wife said, that's preposterous, that's a lie. I said, no, it isn't. She's right. That 7% is active and got money and got the Koch brothers behind them and the NRA and everything else. And they're going to go. They're going to hit those speed dials. They're going to write those letters, send that email. The other 90% are going to sit out there and think everybody's sane and going to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, they aren't sane and they aren't going to do the right thing. <laughs> The only way we're ever going to get change is if you ask for it, demand it. That's the only way we're going to get change. I'm convinced of that. Now, I have, I have great hope for the future because of what I see in my students. My students are cynical about Washington. They're cynical about their government. But they're also they're energized to get a hold of it and change it. And I do everything I can to put my students in the NSA, the CIA, the DIA, and every other federal acronym I can get them into. Because I tell them, you're the only way it's going to change. You are the only way it's going to change. The last 20 years, Harvard, Yale, Cornell, Dartmouth have been sending their best students to Wall Street. And you wonder why we got police? 25%. Of the top 10% of the Ivy Leagues has been going to Wall Street and making 300000 the first year. We need those people going to the federal government. We need those people going to places like state government and local government and so forth. We need those bright minds helping this republic, not screwing it. Mm. Yeah. Uh. Uh, I'm all for these, these kids, but it, it'll take a long time. And, and I hate to leave them such a legacy, such a challenge to fix. Some of you out there now, I'm talking to you. <laughs> You're going to have to fix it. So it's time the American people became alert and knowledgeable. It's time they pushed back. It's time they took their government back. Yes. I'll close with a story. Yesterday, I was in the day before yesterday, I was in the Pentagon. <coughs> My first time back there in about a year or so. And I was there with a guy by the name of Mikey Weinstein. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 And I was also there with Ambassador Joe Wilson, Valerie Williams. Yeah. Valerie yeah. Flames. Yeah. Flames. Yeah. And we were sitting there with a three star who is the staff judge advocate for the Air Force, a one star who is his chaplain, chaplain for the Air Force, and a two star who is the deputy IG, they call him the DIG. And they were listening to us tell them about some of the things that are going on with a group called the Dominionists oh, yeah. in the ranks of the military. Amen. And they, their jaws had to be picked up off the bottom of the table when we got through the talk. Some of the emails that Mikey gets will just blow you away. Okay. Just blow you away. But what I wanted to tell you was that Mikey comes out, Joe couldn't get through the security. U.S. <laughs> ambassador wow. couldn't get through the security. Wow. I got through because I have a military ID card and a couple other things, you know. I he got through because he had his uh, retired ID card and he had his uh, uh, concealed carry card from New Mexico. Because he has to carry. He has a security detail now. These, these so-called, I don't know their Christ. I do not know their Christ. My wife is Catholic, I'm Baptist. I do not know their Christ. They have sworn to kill Mikey. They have prayer circles, and they pray for Mikey to burn in hell forever, and for wow. one of their members to kill him. Wow. So he, he has a security detail, he carries a weapon. We're standing there, and he said, I thought this building belonged to the people. Yeah. And I said, Mikey, where have you been? Yeah. <laughs> this building doesn't belong to the people. Washington doesn't belong to the people. Have you seen the motorcade of the president? 
The Praetorian Guard of the President of the United States? I said George III would salivate at it. <laughs> we have monarchs for four years or eight years. That's what we have. I walked by a motorcade the other day. It wasn't even the president or the vice president. It was the cabinet member, and there were eight cars in it. Oh. Wow. Lincoln used to walk from the White House to the telegram office to read the damn cables on the war. Yeah. Can you imagine someone doing that today? Wow. And they say, oh, well, security's different. He'd be killed. So what? We'd find another one. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! We need to wake up. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah.